Begin transmission. Hello, everybody. It is Chris and Ben for Outer Rim Transmission. This is episode 165 here on our weekly Star Wars podcast show. This week, we aren't joined by Milton, but we certainly have a lot to talk about. And hopefully between the two of us, we're able to make sense of it all because this, I'll be honest, is not going to be the most joyous and fun episode of the podcast. Just warning you all now, um, we are talking, unfortunately, about the cancellation of, of another Star Wars series, um, and that will be The Acolyte. Uh, Acolyte had a lot of potential, and we're going to be talking about the lost opportunities of Lucasfilm um, with this series and everything else. That's going to point towards what the future could possibly be happening at Lucasfilm. What's going on over there? Giving our best theories or our best speculation based on, on what happens there. Uh, we also have some other stories. Um, and there's a bright thing I want to end on. So so I'm going to leave this on a slightly happier note. But, <laughs> you know, this is, this is definitely one of those episodes that I don't ever want to have to record. Um, so there you go. But Ben, I know it's just been a couple short days since we've had our last podcast because, uh, spoiler alert, we're doing a pre recorded show. I'm busy on this weekend, so everybody will still get their weekly show, but we're just recording it um, off air. So, but usually we are live and we'll get into the housekeeping right after our usual our week in Star Wars. But I'll throw it over to you, Ben. First of all, how are you feeling? Good, good. It's uh, been a good week and whatnot since our our uh, last podcast a few days ago. You know, just kind of doing the normal like fitness thing and family time with relatives from out of town and whatnot. So that's been all good this week. Um, and then for me, really, like for my week in Star Wars, it hasn't been like a crazy week. There's nothing really um, too eventful that's happened in the last three days. Um, but like for me, it's just really been kind of just the normal thing like consuming star wars content like on youtube um or like scrolling through um like instagram reels because those are always funny for star wars content like i just sent one to milton literally right before we started recording the podcast and it was funny because it was like the caption said um the caption said you know when you're talking to one of your friends who's a conspiracy theorist and it was the clip of count dooku talking to obi-wan saying like you know uh, a Sith Lord controls the Senate, yeah. yada, 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 that whole thing from Attack of the Clones. So it's just, it's funny seeing little memes like that. Um, so yeah, my my week in Star Wars is mainly just like, you know, just scrolling through and seeing funny content people's made on social media, which is nice compared to, you know, a lot of the other things going on in Star Wars social media this week. Yeah, I, I told you in our private chat, I'm like, I am kind of out of the fandom anymore. I, I don't want to engage... I don't want to see it because even in other projects now, like this negativity and the toxicity has started seeping into other things that have like no apparent problems at all. And people are starting to come at with different things like related to the acolyte based on other Star Wars projects. So it's just like, we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. Um, but yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I mean, yeah, the, 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 at least like finding some light in the darkness, so to speak, when it comes to a week like this week is 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 hard to find. But it's good that you find it out there. Uh, for me, um, uh, I got my my Death Trooper gun in Star Wars Hunters. That's about the only eventful thing uh, with Star Wars that's a positive for me right now. Um, grinding through the battle pass and, and Star Wars Hunters. You know, we're about to get the Star, Star Wars Outlaws game in a, in a few days here if you have the early access. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to keep things lighter on the, on the gaming side of things. I've not unfortunately read any more of the Dawn of the Jedi Legends Essential book because I left it over at my girlfriend's place. I just got it back. So hopefully the following week I'll have more to report on because, as I said before, I am enjoying the, the first 30 pages that I've read of the book so far. So there's a lot more of the book left. I think it's just shy under 300 pages, which for a Star Wars book is a little bit on the smaller side of things. So I'm looking forward to just like diving in and, and hopefully finishing it off um, faster than some other books. But there is a, another High Republic book coming out the day that the, the, the Outlaws Early Access begins, which I'm just like, oh my gosh. So I've got to put the book on the back burner for a change because when it comes to, I guess like this is kind of a topic, like prioritizing Star Wars, what do you do? My bread and butter is the video games. That always come first for me. 
So that is where my order of operations go in this case. If I have two releases on one day, I'm putting all my attention on Outlaws. I know the reviews are coming out on Monday, which is, means that's the blackout day. Once, once that time hits, I'm going to be staying off social media, which, as I just mentioned earlier, will be a blessing in disguise. I feel like just staying off of social media until I beat the game, even if it takes me 40 hours, I'm just not going to be on the internet for, or at least on Twitter. I put it this way, I'll be on there to post things, but I'm not going to try to scroll. Because all I need to do is see somebody with a double blade lightsaber and I'm going to lose my mind. And I'm going to be so mad because that's exactly what happened. Not quite, actually. I, my, I'm my very spoiler phobic when it comes to things I really am looking forward to in Star Wars. Not everything I'm going to be like this for. But when I played Jedi Fallen Order the day before that game came out, the first Jedi game, um, I got a YouTube recommended thumbnail video pop up on my phone of like, oh, you could use a double bladed lightsaber in this game. And I know that might sound like the most like innocuous kind of unimportant feature. But for me, I had no idea there was going to be double blade lightsabers and I would have much preferred to get that really cool shocking revelation by playing the game itself. Not just happening to have a, a, a freaking thing that I couldn't even control on my phone. So, of course, as soon as I fat figured that out, I went into my settings and just like disabled recommended video notifications because I'm like, I'm not messing with this anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, spoilers like that can happen. They happen... Anywhere, I mean, I famously got spoiled about Darth Maul through, like, a comment section um, on ESPN. Like, what? someone just randomly commented on it on one of their posts, and it was the most liked comment, so it was the top comment. Um, and I was just like, holy crap, this is two days before the movie's out. How did these people find this out? But it was on there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so... Yeah, I know I kind of jumped around a little bit there, but yeah, I'm still in Star Wars. I'm still watching it, still consuming it. And uh, yeah, I think that's as good a place as any to kind of transition in to the housekeeping. So we can usually be found live on YouTube on Sundays at 7 p.m. Eastern, except for this weekend. And well, in October, I'll be at the usual New York Comic Con. So you can expect us to like probably not even have a show that week. Um, but usually we are here at 7 p.m. And if you can't make it live, no big deal. We are available on all podcast streaming services such as Spotify and Apple Music. So do feel free to tell a friend. If you have anybody that's involved with Star Wars, wants to learn a little bit more about the ins and outs of things, recommend the channel here at Star Raptor on YouTube as well as on Outer Rim Transmission on any podcast streaming service of your choice. As far as uploads this week, it's been very, very light here on YouTube.com slash Star Raptor. I have my reviews of the comics that came out this week, which were the High Republic Adventures issue number nine and Star Wars issue number 49, which happens to be the penultimate issue of that series. So we have one issue left of Darth Vader and Star Wars before we bridge the gap into Return of the Jedi, which both those issues, those final finality, uh, finale issues come out next month. So very, very exciting. They're going to be like double issues each. So there's going to be a lot of uh, meat a lot of good stuff to dig in on those but um yeah it's been a very light week not any substantial news uh last week we talked about the i talked about the young jedi adventures so they are out if you haven't watched them already let your your you know your your grandchildren or niece and nephews or your kids know about them because uh they're there to watch all 11 episodes but yeah so as if this week didn't start yeah you know, basically it was on monday i think and the week certainly didn't start off very good because according to Tamar Morrison, who was at Fan Expo Chicago, I don't know if he was just asked this question or what happened to even reveal the information, but he says, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not even in Mandalorian Grogu. Um, according to him, just paraphrasing things, basically it didn't get enough views for Book of Boba Fett, so they're just not going to utilize the character right now because of of the ratings. So, what's your reactions to that, Dan? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, my first reaction to that, um, before I get into more stuff about that, is just like, it's kind of disappointing that he could potentially not be in it just because it's like, it's Boba Fett. And like, you know, like Tamara Morrison has like joked about, you know, 
like people always say, you know, there there is truth in comedy, and like you know, when you joke around, like there is truth to it when you're joking about something. And like Tamara Morrison has joked several times that like you know, Mando basically kind of like hijacked his his show. So like, you know, Tamara Morrison probably doesn't feel like a great great way of, about how that all went down, and he was probably thinking, man, put me in mando's movie and let me like shine in that you know and so like with him it's like i feel bad because you know like you can tell tamara morrison like how much he cares about playing that character mm-hmm. and like how much how much he's enjoyed playing it i mean you know look how good he was with hannah at that uh um from the race side at the convention she went to a couple months ago like he literally interviewed with her and like mm-hmm. gave her like a shout out in front of like everybody yeah, yeah and like so he's like such a good, good, good dude. It seems like. So it stinks. They're not gonna use him more. Which the thing is, like to me, it's like, you know, it kind of falls in the line of like, all right, sure, if his show isn't working, I get it. Maybe not to renew it, but why would you not include a legacy character when you're bringing Star Wars back to theaters? Is my thing. Like, like because Boba Fett would would. Even though obviously your parents or like general people would know who Mando and Grogu are by now, it's just the fact that it's Boba Fett. Throwing Boba Fett in your marketing would help to a degree, but that's kind of like my opening thoughts on this whole topic. Oh yeah, it's it's a shame. And, and you know Matthew Nuga Bauer and Dominic Jones of the Star Wars Underworld are potentially meeting Tamora Morrison right now because he's over there. At, according to Matthew, the third largest comic convention in the world i think he said like fan expo toronto is huge and, and i did look at the, oh, yeah. the the guest list and it's it's pretty massive like next to new york comic-con and san diego comic-con it's 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 up there they're they're pulling through a lot of good guests a lot of star wars guests he was ranting through on the tractor beam last night as we recorded uh by the way we're recording on a thursday night if you're just wondering when we were recording this episode um so tomorrow Morrison is there. It just shows you like this guy absolutely loves his fans. He goes all the way over. He goes all over the freaking world to these conventions and it's not obligated. Like he doesn't, I'm pretty sure he doesn't need to do this. He just does it because he likes to meet the fans and he has a great time doing it. He is a great ambassador for the band uh, for the brand right like he is always out there as such a positive force such a good guy such jovial you mentioned hannah rayside and just oh yep. man just such a great guy that that's so generous with his time and just to see if this is true and i'm really hoping <laughs> there's always a possibility and nothing's ever set in stone like going back to the promotion of of um uh, no way home spider-man Seeing how adamant <laughs> Andrew Garfield was just like straight up lying, basically, just like, no, I'm not in the movie. And there he is. So after nope. that happened, I don't really take the actors by the word as much anymore because there's always a chance that. And I know you said you have some evidence that he was like away randomly yep. during a convention, like last well, minute pulled out and stuff like that for like yep. the times that they would be filming that movie or something. Yeah, so, okay. So this is the uh, super odd thing. So there was a convention at the end of June. Um, It was at the end of June. And, you know, right around that time was, like, when Mando was starting to film some of their stuff. Um, It was getting reported by, you know, several, like, credited people. Like, you know, you had Pedro Pascal going and... um, you know, Pedro Pascal had like a two or three week block of filming for something that got it got mm. reported, but didn't get reported what it was. Um, right around that same time, Bill Burr was saying he was Ooh. secretly filming something. <gasps> and then on top of all of that, right in that same time block, Tamara Morrison canceled out of the blue, canceled a big appearance at, you know, some um, expo or some con. So it's like. Why would this guy, like you said, Chris, who's always doing all these fan things, you know, traveling everywhere, why would he cancel something out of the blue like that? Because that was last minute when they announced that. It was, you know, days before. So it's like, you know, are 
did he because it was like the end of june like i said it was like i think it was like june 29th or something so and that was right around the same time pedro had his stuff going on whatever it was bilber and it just makes me wonder like if it's a situation like are we gonna have a situation where it's gonna be like, did they film a potential, maybe even a post credit scene, if we want to speculate a little? Like, did they film maybe a... You know, technically, Tamara Morrison could not be in the movie, but maybe there's a post credit scene, like Boba showing up, being like, yo, Mando, I need help. Or maybe Mando going to Boba, going, hey, we need help about Thrawn coming, yada, yada, yada. Like, that sort of thing. So, like, I just think there's a lot of evidence there that's point, pointing to it, and, like... Maybe they're looking for a potential pop. Like, who knows? Maybe they filmed a Darth Vader Rogue One-esque scene like Boba Fett just kicking butt, you know, doing something in that movie. Like, maybe they did something like that, like yeah. akin to Mando Season 2. Like, I just think... I don't know. It's just weird he wouldn't be in the movie for, like, all the obvious reasons of him just being a legacy character and him being back in the fold now. So I just think if I had to put five bucks on it, I'd predict it's... It's like a 70% chance he's probably either a post-credit or just in the movie to a degree. Yeah, so when it comes to what they were filming, I mean, a lot of what they were filming was probably for that D23 teaser, I would imagine. Yep. They kind of had to, like, fast-track a lot of sequences, so I'm guessing, like, most of it is that. But, I mean, so I'm thinking that maybe he was part of those, and if that's the case, he's going to have a very minimized role. I feel like... He might pop up for like five minutes in this like two hour movie, something very like him and Bill Burr or something like he might pop up like very, you know, not very large thing because he was only gone. Like, like, I don't know how long they plan on shooting this movie, but if it started in June, I, I would imagine most movies shoot for what, like four to six months or something like that. So, yeah, uh, well, yeah, well, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go on. I was just saying, if it's like, I feel like it's a very minimal thing. Like, he's going to give Mando information. Mando's going to go to Tatooine. It's going to be in like a nice expositional shot of, oh, yeah, this is what I've done with my kingdom now. And he might mention, oh, there's some people, yeah. but I have the pure power. Like, it'll be some kind of expositional thing of what has happened on Tatooine with him and Fennec Shan there. You might see like some different um, things hanging up on the walls, yeah, different banners, man, you know, whatever. And he's going to give Mando information that he's seeking to go somewhere else. And it's going to be a very, like, touch-and-go kind of thing. That's what I would expect. Yep. I, I think it's definitely along those lines. Or who knows, maybe it's going to be, like, you know, if he gives Mando info about, like, where to start looking for Thrawn or something. Like, you know, where, where you know, since Boba Fett's, like, travel the galaxy. Or have you heard of, like, Dathomir? Or, like, you know, just something, like, to go looking for Thrawn, potentially. Or, like... Um, like, I don't know. I just think, yeah, it's going to be, like you said, kind of touch and go, probably. And the thing is, too, um, you know, just from, like, like Jason Ward of Making Star Wars, like, you know, he always, he's out in that area where they film. And, like, as of July, they were still building a lot of the sets. So, like, whatever they filmed was probably in the volume, I would assume. Um, so it's mm. just, like... I, it's definitely going to be a really, like you said, like a tight knit scene. Probably, like you said, just I would guess maybe even Jabba's throne room type thing, like where he's sitting in there. Mando comes in, and it's just kind of like little chit chat back and forth, and then go. If I had to guess, mm -hmm. I just I don't know. I just think all the all the signs to me, like I, I don't know. It could just me be like rationalizing it or whatever, but I just feel like. Boba Fett's too easy not to put in a movie. Like, Star Wars being back in theaters and you're not putting Boba Fett in it, it's yeah. just like... I, I don't know. I just think it's... To me, it's too obvious. Yeah, it just... Think, I mean, it's it's interesting. Like, okay, uh, the views were good enough. Uh, let's punish this character. It's like, wait, what? This was one of the most influential Star Wars characters. I mean, you can't go to a convention without seeing somebody cosplaying as Boba Fett. There's been countless memes, countless sound clips, everything you could imagine. This is one that, like, this is on the, the Mount Rushmore of Star Wars characters, right? Like, you have the Emperor, you have Darth Vader, you have Luke Skywalker, 
you have Grogu. Han Solo or something. I, I'm just picking four. There's a lot more than four that you could put on that mountain. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know what I mean? He's a pinnacle. Yeah. He's a pillar of the Star Wars fandom. And uh, to see him just sidelined simply because one of the, the series he was in didn't do as well seems like an overreaction to me. And that's one thing yeah. that I feel like Lucasfilm is doing a lot is a lot of like reactionary stuff not a lot of proactive planning it's just like oh this doesn't work okay that means we have to excise this from everything and then we'll get a better product no no that just because one creator didn't handle him as the best way he should have shouldn't keep him punished and out of action especially when tomorrow morrison did a great job with what he had to work with yeah, the prime the prime example of it is if I was Tamara Morrison, what I would do, if this is, let's just say, take that face value for a moment and say he's not in the movie, as of right now anyways. If I was him, I would go to like John, Dave, heck, I mean, I'm sure he has, I'm sure he could go, go to Kathleen Kennedy if he had to and be like, hey, um, forget my show for a minute. Let's go back and look at the internet when my character came in in Mando Season 2 Episode 6 and just did this awesome action montage and the entire world was talking about me like because that to me is one of the best scenes action sequences in all of star wars history like mm -hmm. it was a it was amazing scene like i would have never pictured boba fett coming in and just you know <laughs> pretty much giving us a showing of all of his gadgets like yeah. that was so cool um and, and i just think i just think that's his resume right there like he could literally just go and show that scene and be like hey uh, let's rewind and let's see what people are saying about me around then. Like, it's not my fault the show went the way it did. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know, like you said, I feel like it's too, I don't know, it's kind of too far-fetched to punish one character out of a show. Like, people can understand, like, people can look at the book of Boba Fett and understand why the show didn't work. And it was not because of Tamara Morrison. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's just it's 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 interesting. Um especially See, considering what? the next story we're gonna get into is just like, okay, I show that's like not a timeline. This is a character that could still be folded into current events. It's it's not like you just have to completely forget about him now. Yeah, well see what I wonder though, Chris, is like instead of them throwing in two Mando episodes, obviously we love the Luke stuff and Ahsoka stuff and whatever from that show. But why not throw in two more Boba episodes and, like, stretch out his story a little more? Give us more story of, like, the Tusken Raiders. Or even, like, I was talking with my buddy about this the other day when we saw this news. Like, why not? I thought it was such an odd creative decision. Like, you could have tweaked some things to have, like, instead of the Tusken Raiders get wiped out. Why not, like, as, like, a symbolism of, like, Boba Fett uniting the planet? Why not the final sequence have the farmers uniting with the Tusken Raiders to take down the pikes and stuff like hmm. like you know because then he's uniting everybody versus just you know the the folks of freetown so it's like i just i i think creative decisions there is what really hampered that show and it's just it's unfortunate tamara morrison's basically getting punished for yeah something that was completely out of his control yeah all they need to do now we say we have a little cameo approach, but, but but why not make that appearance on Tython 2.0 in this movie, right? This is a oh, movie, yeah. not a series, so actions speak louder than words. A lot of times with audiences, they'll really get a pop and be like, if we have that moment where Boba Fett just goes absolute crazy on some stormtroopers again, like imagine a word just of mouth Dave mando or something Ima imagine yeah teaming up with mando imagine a word yep. of mouth like oh my gosh you're telling your friends or your co-workers like dude you have to see the mandalorian grogu there is like one of the most badass sequences featuring boba fett just smashing in stormtrooper helmets using his jetpacks to just melt stormtroopers like yep. you're gonna automatically get people to be like okay i'm gonna see it this weekend like that sounds awesome like and then that'll completely turn people's you know perspectives of him back to where they were before i think they just have to do a little bit of damage control um yep. 
you know, don't erase his story. Just say, uh, blah, 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 you know, this is what he's been doing. Have him actually in battle again, and it'll be all good for most people, I think. Well, well, they have their out. They have their out in that yeah. show, though. I was talking to my friend about it the other day. Boba literally says at the end to Fennec, oh, I don't know if we're cut out for this. Yeah. So if you don't even want to go back to Tatooine, why not just have Boba literally come in to, like, do some cool sequence, like you said, and... You can kind of wipe out that show in a couple lines. Literally, you just have Mando ask him, hey, what about that stuff on Tatooine, yada, yada? And Boba would just be like, hey, not for me. Moved on. I'm, I'm just, you know, going around the galaxy or whatever. Blah, 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 blah. Like, they could easily just kind of just wipe away those events very easily. Like, it, it's right there on a silver platter. It's just if they want to take it or not. Yeah, yeah. So, getting to the main part of the episode, if you haven't heard by now, you've read the title, you know what we're about to talk about, The Acolyte has been cancelled, uh, simply put. Um, this comes to us from Deadline, um, so they have the official, they have the official report. Alright, exclusive. The story of the Accolade will not continue with Lucasfilm opting not to proceed with a second season of the Star Wars offshoot starring Amanda Stenberg. Sources tell Deadline. Word of the decision comes more than a month after the eight-episode first season of the series. From creator, director, executive producer, and showrunner Leslie Headland wrapped its run on Disney+. Plus. The news is not entirely surprising. The Eccolade did okay with critics, 78% of Rotten Tomatoes, but divided Star Wars fans, which was reflected in its overall viewership. Driven by interest into the venerable uh, franchise, the Eccolade got off to a strong start. When it launched June 4th with two episodes generating 4.8 million views in its first day on the streamer to rank as the biggest series premiere on Disney Plus this year. The tally rose to 11.1 million uh, views globally after five days. Corroborating Disney's data, the series made its debut on Nelson's Top 10 Originals chart in its premiere work at, week at number 7, 488 million minutes viewed, climbing to s number 6 that week but the acolyte could not sustain the momentum dropping out of the top 10 in week three and staying off before returning after the release of the finale at number 10 with 335 million minutes believed to be the lowest for a star wars series finale so there you have it i was very very curious what was happening because i went to san diego comic-con and during the Star Wars panel for the publishing and the games and all, Leslie Edlin popped up on a video call and I turned over to Dominic and I was like, hey man, she's about to tell us like they're getting season two. Like this is where they're going to do it right here with the books. They're talking about High Republic. They're going to talk about how they're going to continue this High Republic live action. And well, she basically just acknowledged the fans like, yeah, we've had a great time working on this and collaborating with the Lucasfilm and, and all this, the, the architects of the higher pop, yada, yada, yada. Then three weeks or two weeks later, D23 pops up and, uh, you know, we had Andor, we had Skeleton Crew, we had Mano Grogu, and it was crickets on the Acolyte for that main presentation. But then by the second day, you had Manny Jacinto plays the stranger there at the convention doing a panel one-on-one -on -one panel him just talking about the acolyte and you thought okay they didn't announce it on that opening night ceremony maybe they'll do it at an actual acolyte panel and at one point he just says oh i hope i hope we make a second season the thing my fingers are crossed and it's like wait what so and here i was like okay Disney and Lucasfilm, they're going to be Disney Lucasfilm. They're going to just announce the Acolyte Season 2 as a footnote for something else like the way they did it with Ahsoka Season 2 when they announced the Mando and Grogu movie, right? It's just like a random Tuesday at 12 o'clock Eastern Time. They'll just drop a thing saying, oh, we're working on Season 2. And, well, we weren't hanging very long, were we? Because they, they canceled it pretty much a month after the last episode aired. So... Uh, as you can imagine, I was not happy. <laughs> this, they, they announced this on Monday, and I was uh, I was not a happy camper. I was ranting a lot. 
God bless my girlfriend for putting up with me for <laughs> two hours of dinner, just sitting there going, going on and on and on and on about this this whole decision. So I had a lot, I had a lot to say. There's a lot to break down with this, but what was your overall reaction to this news? Yeah. So for me, um, for starters as well, just to note. When it comes to, like, you know, Deadline or Hollywood Reporter and things, like, when these outlets report things, these aren't just coming from, you know, like, random sources. These are, you know, ba it's basically Lucasfilm announcing it. Mm -hmm. is, you know, where they, that that's where, like, you know, these outlets, they, they get their information from. It's not like, you know, our other Star Wars reporters getting it from sources. So, anyways, um, yeah, for me, with this show, like, I... I was all right. So I had mixed feelings. I had all right. Let me let me rethink my words. So I <laughs> I was not surprised the show got canceled because just because of the fact of you know just the pure numbers of everything. Like like you mentioned, the viewership went down over time. It you know barely cracked the top ten at the finale, and then the cost of the show i think i think that's one of the big points okay that they pro that they probably got hung up on i would assume is the cost because it was around 180 million it got reported um you know a couple years ago so you know when you have a 180 million dollar show it's not doing good on viewership it's kind of shaky with critics very divided with fans it just falls in that category of like why would we renew this when we could just let it go you know it's not connected to mando it's not even connected to the first nine movies so let's just cut bait now versus spending more money into it versus like like i i i wholeheartedly believe if this show was like a 70 million dollar show it would it would have got renewed because yeah. it just it, i i think that's a big part of it and then like you know we can't overlook the facts um you know you know we had that and i just think I just think those are the big things. Like, I really believe, like, it's obviously it's like the viewership, but I really believe it's just like the pure numbers that got it canceled. Because, mm. like, just just because you, you know, it's just hard to like argue numbers, you know, when it comes to like those types of things. And we already know. I mean, look, Bob Iger's back in town with Disney. He's he's scaling back on Marvel. I mean, he literally said Marvel's only going to do two movies a year and one what? show a year. Other, th yeah, he said he literally said that just. A couple weeks ago, he said crazy. two movies per year, two movies per year, one show per year, unless it's a special event like the Avengers. Other than that, that's what they're scaling back to. So the thing is, Marvel has so many more individual properties than Star Wars at the moment. So if they're scaling back Marvel to two and one, what are they going to do with Star Wars? Oh. Like, so you know, that's why it doesn't surprise me they're 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 cutting this back. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like my my opening thoughts on that it's just kind of like the pure just the like pure just hardcore numbers of it i think that's what got it canceled more than just about anything okay this is the one time i want i want to have bob chapek back <laughs> if bob chapek was in was in power you better believe he would be green in like three more seasons of the oh, this, <laughs> boba fett kenobi all these shows would have been renewed yeah yeah um, darn it darn it Start Bob Iger getting in and completely disrupting our entertainment. No, <laughs> it was not that is, he wasn't really a good leader to be to be hanging around any longer than he sh than he should have, you know. But yeah. um, what comes out to me was like, I think the show got started off on the right on the wrong foot. Um, you know, I, I have a problem with these these audience scores and it's not the end all be all but when like people start review bombing the heck out of a show like a day before it's even out then you know there's a there's a flaw with rotten tomatoes and this is not even a conspiracy theory at all this is it might sound like i'm going into one but to be honest like there's a lot of people that will look at rotten tomato to like even try to like okay i'm not gonna waste my time with this show so if they see something as is like 20 percent <laughs> audience they're like oh this is not going to be something i wasted my time with so the fact that there was it, it appears that it was a review bombing because why else would it be down to 10 percent like a day or two before the thing was even out that that already started off on the wrong foot i know it, it started off pretty well according to these ratings like 11 point 
one million views, I feel like that's that's a good number in the first week. But they could have had more people, and then more people might have stuck around, and it might have been saved. That they're they're yeah. so there's a link, but it's a far fetched link. But I, I'm just like recounting the chronological events of like, okay, like there there was already an uphill battle, so to speak, with this show based on people um, just not agreeing with certain creators behind the wheel and things like yeah. that, which made it a little bit harder than let's say like you know just the mandalorian or or whatever yep. show so oh yeah i yeah i mean i have a personal uh, a first hand story about that so like you have or not about the rating specifically it's like the stuff going into the show leading into the finale so like or to the, to the premiere i'm sorry but to the premiere like you know you have people you know going in and crushing it on the review scores of course and then like it's just so much to me it's so much public stuff with star wars it's always like fans fighting or creators fighting or actors fighting it's like it's like there's such like a almost like bow and arrow environment in the mm. star wars world yeah between like fans and creatives and things like because so like i have a friend who's a uh a twitch streamer and a madden content creator and he's just he's okay he's a star wars fan and he, you know, he, he, he's a Star Wars fan. He watches everything, but he doesn't follow it like we do. Well, like every single day, you know, our lives are Star Wars. Well, anyways, leading up to the Acolyte, you know, I, like I mentioned before, like when it comes to Star Wars, it's just like, you know, certain headlines get out there, like from like Leslie Headland and folks behind the screen, behind the scenes of the show, you know, it can get people thinking differently about the show. Cause like, I'm not kidding you. Like I got a message from him probably two weeks before the show came out and he said dude like i've i've seen like weird article headlines from that director of the this the upcoming star wars show and it sounds like you know she pretty much doesn't want like guys to watch the show or doesn't care to you know and, and like the thing is and like i told him i said well no not necessarily yeah but the problem is the problem is like the way a lot of folks at um star wars communicate things like, like you know their quotes can be taken out of context and put in headlines. And then that's when you get, like I said, a random person like that messaging me and being like, Hey, what's up with this? And like, that's where, you know, that can snowball into, you know, then you get into like the toxic crowd of things They're you know, using that as ammunition and blah, 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 blah. And then it's just it snowballs and snowballs and snowballs into this big thing. And it's just like, there's just, I don't know if I'm star Wars, like, I think they're getting better with some of their public like communications in terms of like the quotes they release and things like they've definitely improved since since after the acolyte came out um they have started improving i can say which isn't a long time we've only we're only like five weeks six weeks seven weeks after the acolyte but like you know since then like even at that d23 event we had like dave talking and john and you know whoever else mm -hmm. versus like kathleen kennedy so like they're they're improving their public persona, which is good, to, and I would say to like improve the health of the fandom, which will just contribute to these things potentially like improving scores on shows and, um, you know, maybe not spreading as bad of word of the mouth as potentially there could be. So like, I, I don't know. I just think leading into a show like this, it's just such a mixed bag between like, you know, the extreme fans some of the comments of creators and people on the show and it's mm. just like it's just like i go back and forth and then you have kind of like normal ish fans like us in the middle where it's like oh we're getting caught in the crossfire of everything yeah, i and know it's just like it's just like like christian harloff always says it on his show all the time huh. like Star Wars, a lot of star wars has turned into almost like politics you have the extreme yep. side of one side extreme side of the other and then you have everybody in the middle that just gets caught in the crossfire <laughs> oh that's a good way of putting it it really is it really is and that's why i'm like oh my gosh this week um it's been especially annoying to try to try to keep a level head and try to be neutral yep. i try to be neutral i try to uh, understand both sides of, of the of the conflict here if you will and uh I just learned that sometimes you can't you can't make sense of any any side and it's just okay let me just go away and just enjoy what i want to enjoy and not not engage in that because 
people are set in their ways and uh no matter what you say you expect that somebody's gonna get mad at you and just like start tearing you up on the on the internet i'm not i'm not about wasting my time in that way um yep i mean i can say that like you know for example even if you know i'm sure like leslie headland you know has her beliefs strongly in her beliefs and stuff but like even if she would come out and like say hey guys you know i i said some stuff that probably divide you know probably got you guys upset whatever you know i apologize yada 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 like (laughs) you know people want to take that apology though you know that's that's the problem (laughs) like people would say you know you're just trying to save face for you know another season so it's just like a lot of times these creators can't win when it comes to these situations um but i just think this whole acolyte situation is interesting because like i said it's just there's so many sweeping changes going on with star wars right now yeah so joel davis from ion cannon part of the star wars underworld network he's he's been in the weeds with this stuff for a while and he's been telling me that um basically like ever since bob Iger took over i guess was what like last year or something like he has basically november december okay yeah he has basically like completely revamped their vision is now movies as you were kind of alluding to before with like marvel just so it seems like for a show to succeed like i've even heard reports that ahsoka another legacy character was almost axed for a season two like remember it was like it was an uncomfortable wait i think we were waiting for like several weeks like wait like what do you mean we might not get a season two and then it was a footnote in the mandalorian and grogu and i really strongly think that the only reason why ahsoka got even confirmed for a season two is because dave filoni has a lot of pull at lucasfilm to be able to just like okay if he wanted it like if he if he worked hard enough for it they would let him do that because he is literally like the heir apparent to george lucas so the fact that acolyte was like an up-and-coming new creative for star wars that was in charge like they are even more likely to do it because it wasn't as like a a close-knit person to lucasfilm i would imagine oh yeah i think i think the only reason obviously we you know ahsoka's a good show and stuff but i i think the main reason that show didn't get axed is because dave filoni is the cco of the Mm -hmm. company um and like him being basically second in line behind kathy I think that's why. Mm-hmm. And also, I think, you know, while we're on the Dave topic, that's something I noted as well. I saw someone post this um, on Twitter, so I can't take credit for it. Um, it's another content creator. It's just like, it makes me wonder as well, you know, if they're really kind of backing Dave in a lot of things. Because, you know, I saw someone post and they, they were like, oh, you know, it just begs the question, Are is Star Wars transitioning more to dave really really being involved with things like as in his vision like you know kind of the kevin feige situation feige pretty much decides everything for marvel are they transitioning the company to where say in a few years that's pretty much how it's going to be getting ran like dave's vision of star wars because if you think about it acolyte's gone andor's andor's done i mean yeah. andor season two andor season two was already in the can pretty much before Dave even got that promotion, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, so, so I don't even include that. And then the only thing on the horizon, it's the Favreau movie, the Filoni movie, the Ahsoka show, maybe the Mangold movie, maybe some of the others projects that we've heard whispers about, but it's like, it makes you wonder, Yeah, are they in a transition period to transition to more like Dave Filoni led projects and stuff? And like, it makes me wonder like, is Dave getting more maybe involved with potentially even like, this is just me speculating, but like the Ray movie, like, cause mm. we keep, it's just every month Daisy Ridley's like, Oh yeah, the script's coming soon. And then where is it? Like it's it was supposed the, to be there months ago. Yeah. She's been saying the script's coming soon since like January. So, you know, and we're sitting here at the end of August. So I, I just wonder if the Lucasfilm's in a transition period I where I feel like it is, you know, maybe, maybe Dave, maybe Dave, I'm sure Dave liked aspects of the Acolyte, but he probably, if they are in a transition period, is it, it was he like, all right, this probably just won't fit our, our plans. Yeah. And here, um, here, like, and this is where I, the title comes in. The Acolyte has been canceled. Uh, now what, you know, it's just like, 
because it seemed like the Acolyte would have been a nice like show to tide us over until whatever this next wave of uh, whatever content would be because right now I'm assuming that Ahsoka season two will probably not be out till 2026 so next year it's just going to be like focus on Andor and then we'll get to Mando and Grogu um, the following year and then shortly after that I'm sure we'll get like Ahsoka in the fall of like That's 2026 but then it's like the dead zone. What's going to happen early 2027? They would have had to at least start the planning stages of like what is coming next. Because when we got the announcement of the Acolyte and everything else, that was four years before the Acolyte even came out. This was in December of 2020. We're here in, you know, 2024. So I'm that's what I'm like wondering. Like what what is even the future of Disney Plus? Are they going to just kind of abandon it? for the most part after Ahsoka at this point are they going to I mean I'm, I'm assuming that the, the, the animation will always live here but is that enough for Star Wars to even like that's where I'm just scratching my head right now there's, a, there's nothing concrete out there we're just you know doing spitballs at the wall here to see what sticks it's like all right, what is the future now that I feel like the Acolyte season two could have been another 2026 show and then they could have done 2027 maybe if they fast tracked and that could have held them over until whatever comes next. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, I think that's I think that's what's going on. I think right now we're in the transition period of Lucasfilm and I think like like I said, I saw that tweet and it, it got me thinking I really the more I think about it, it just makes sense. Like, if, you know, Dave's the CCO, everything, like, after Andor ends, it's pretty much a clean slate for him. To, you know, it's a brand new page, like, start from ground zero, basically. And it makes me wonder if they're going to just have a time right now. Maybe, um, because this is, this is a, a critique, like, so, like, I, I heard Christian Harloff bring this up before, and it, it it makes to me it makes a lot of sense it's like his thing is with star wars is he wishes it would just keep pushing forward like marvel next story next story next story versus going back in the past so it makes me wonder if they go and like you know you have the mando movie you have ahsoka you have the filoni movie and who knows when 27 or 28 and it just makes you wonder are they going to keep just pushing forward through the mando verse era clear up to force awakens potentially like you know are we gonna get a i don't know like who knows maybe they recast like a luke and like do like a young luke and kylo ren thing or something or ben solo thing like i just think there's a chance we might start um in that kind of like transition period we might like because I, I think there's a chance dave's using this whole t um sandbox right now to kind of do what the Clone Wars did for the prequels for the sequels kind of you know just to slowly build up to it and and I think that's where we're headed honestly like you know we haven't heard too many updates about the Mangold movie um you know there's there's different things out there about the Sean Levy movie like he he mm -hmm. actually just made comments on his Deadpool press tour by the way about that <laughs> um and he said he was you know writing ideas down and he couldn't talk about it so um <laughs> it's just like I think what the only thing is, like, you know, we know the Mando movie, we know the Dave movie. The, those are the only two concrete things we know of at the moment, for sure, and Ahsoka. So it's like, it feels like we're transitioning more and more to the Filoni-led Star Wars. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing I wanted to touch upon, is what is vibing with the people, right? Because mm -hmm. Book of Boba Fett, you have a legacy character apparently didn't do good enough with the views okay we've been wanting a, a, a series or a movie outside of the skywalker saga since lucasfilm bought out disney uh lucas uh, disney bought out lucasfilm back in 2014 we've been pining i've been pining for okay let's get away from the skywalkers we've seen enough of the rebellion empire Okay, we're all psyched for the acolyte we're all psyched to see the sith in their prime kind of like in the shadows Okay, yeah, the execution wasn't perfect, but it's, it seems like a lot, a lot of people like that either. So, you know, on one hand, it's like, everybody, you know, do the safe thing with Boba Fett. Apparently that didn't work. Okay, do the risky thing. That didn't work. So what I'm afraid of 
is Disney and Lucasfilm are going to be doubling down on just the safe bets for the foreseeable future. And I'm worried that like Star Wars itself, if it keeps going in that direction, is going to lose even more people. Because they're going to just be like, oh, this is another Force Awakens. Oh, this is an, or another A New Hope. This is another Empire. This is another Phantom Man. Like, like, if we start kind of going down that route, you're going to just get into this revolving door of just these creators coming in, do the status quo thing. It's just like a 7.5 out of 10 average kind of thing. And it just, you don't, you lose a lot of creatives in that space. You, you lose a lot of fans that are just like, we want something different. But yeah. it's like when they got something different, it, it didn't resonate. So it's like, I don't know it's, what they do at this point. I think, I mean, I really think your prime prime litmus test, an example of it, of what works is Mando season one. Because mm -hmm. it was different. We didn't have any, I mean, not that I can think of any big characters in that season other than Boba Fett's feet. Um, but like, you know, that show worked because, you know, it was intriguing Obviously, Grogu's cute and everything, but the thing is, the show was such a good adventure show, and I think what they're going to lean into, if I had to make a prediction, is I think, like like you said, when, when you go into the legacy character realm, you, you pretty much can't please anybody because of, you know, just just expectations and things. And, I mean, not even expectations with mm. Boba. It was like, they, Boba, they literally set up expectations in the second season of the show, so I don't, I mean, there's no excuse for that, in my opinion. But, um, but like, I, I think what, if I had to predict the way they'll do it, like you said, if you go outside the Skywalker saga, it's kind of like wishy-washy whether that could work or be well-responded, received with the fans. So I think a happy medium is going to be somewhere between Mando Season 1 of them not having any major characters appear and Mando Season 2, like, because... Mm. And it's, I, I think the way they're going to do it, it's going to be along those lines of, all right, we have, um, you know, we'll, we'll do like these shows, like, like with new characters, for example, but it's going to be, then you'll get the legacy characters popping in for some, some good, good cameos to build into the story and whatnot as a pop. Like, I think that's how they're going to do it. Cause like, you know, you'll have new characters to build. But then, you know, if Boba needs to make a guest appearance or, like, you know, at that point, Din Djarin needs to make a guest appearance if he lives, like, those types of things, they can be kind of built in versus, you know, um, them going, like, completely away from this era. So I think that's maybe where they're headed. And then, I mean, who knows? Maybe we have a bigger future with some of our younger characters in the, in the series right now, like Ezra, like Sabine, um... You know, like those types of like the Rebels crew. Maybe we have more of them um, coming mm. up, um, more more than just the Mando movie. Because like this could be like the baton passing between the OT and the sequel trilogy. Like, hey, what if we get more live action kind of like Rebels esque adventures in this time period? Like maybe we get something along those lines. Like if the Dave movie comes out and is is a banger and just hits really well. And people love those characters. They're gonna be being like, "Hey, I want to see an Ezra Bridger, Ezra Bridger Jedi show mm. after this." Between you know, before Force Awakens, etc. Like, I think that's where they're headed. Is kind of like a medium where you're include. It's new character focused, but you're also in just enough range where you can drop in a legacy character if need be. Yeah, uh, we already have the answer. Really, just make more shows like Andor. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the general consensus, even people that don't like Andor, they can at least they seem to at least appreciate and respect what it is and, and, and understand that like, yeah, it, it could be good for a lot of people. It's not my jam, but the quality that is there, it's that premier uh, kind of HBO House of Dragons sort of quality where it's like, OK, these are longer episodes. Prestige TV is what I mean. Uh, it says it's longer episodes, longer seasons. I don't know if Lucasfilm maybe just like kind of like stubbing they stub their toe a little bit because or, or better analogy is like they're probably just mad now that they didn't just make it like four or five seasons because they could have stretched this out. I mean, they could have kept it going for like a decade and like they would have guaranteed 
hooked audiences that would keep tuning in every season as long as it maintains the quality of season one they would have something to keep disney plus going i think they they jumped the gun when they decided oh we're gonna just wrap it up in two seasons like no you had potential every year could have been a year closer to rogue one which is what we heard from originally for five seasons that would be perfect but again i don't know if it's coming down from disney or if it's a lucasfilm thing just like why are the episodes you know freaking 30 minutes sub sub 30 minutes in some cases and why do we only have eight of them on these series it's a detriment to the, the the creators trying to tell a story here because as case of point the acolyte i'm not saying it's a perfect show by any means i enjoyed it but there's potential there but it was squandered with the the the, the episode length and yep. just not getting into the characters enough to really warrant people getting connected and and really latching on like they would from these other these other shows, you know. Well, think about this. So let's just say we're leave it at the eight episodes, or or um, all right, add another four episodes on like Andor would since Andor was twelve. What if you add on uh, four forty-five minute episodes? That'd be one hundred and eighty minutes, so three hours. If you add another three hours to the show. I'm sure that would have stretched out the story better. It would have let things get explained better. You know, you could have had um, potentially like an actual thing with Plagueis versus just showing him for like a split second. Um, And then even like the twin storyline, you could have made that a little better. Or, I mean, the thing is with the, with that show even, like you could, you could have like retooled the show to a degree to... You know, we all we heard so many like mystery thriller, murder mystery stuff leading up to it. Like, my thing is, I saw someone um, post this. It's like, even if you retool the show, like, heck, you could have changed it to Kai Mir being the primary person taking out Jedi mm-hmm. and having hi- having him under Plagueis, kind of like literally just remove the twins from the story and have Jeki and Soul going on this you know detective work and like you could have retooled the show drastically and like it could have made it potentially more interesting you could have stretched the story out maybe a little better um i I just think there's a lot of like creative things they could have done with a longer runtime because i mean look the the um the fourth episode was like 27 minutes and like yeah it's just it's just not enough when it comes to runtime especially you know, a problem with a show like The Acolyte is, you know, they premiered on a Tuesday. That's two days after House of the Dragon comes on. And those those episodes are all like an hour long minimum. Yeah, much. and it was interesting because some of those episodes are clearly part one and two. So if they would have put yep. some of them together, guess what? There would only be six episodes. And now people are going to complain even more because then they're like, wait, we waited four, four years for a six episode series. Like, what, what the heck is this? So they probably yeah. were like, oh, if we have more volume of episodes. And then, of course, that sacrifices the story because then half the people get to episode four and they're like, this is trash. I'm not going to watch it anymore because of just the way the episodes are structured. And I think that there is a lot of problems. Um, and I don't, I really don't know why it was $180 million to make. It doesn't seem like if it was 70 million to make, we would probably be talking about how excited we are for season two because then they don't have as much of risk to pay for the show. Oh. But why have things gotten to this point? I feel like Disney is the biggest culprit for this because yep. even with their movies and stuff, these budgets are just out of control. Like, where well, is this money going? I, my theory on it, I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, there's no there's been any reporting or whispers or anything. This is just purely speculation. The only thing I could think of, like, don't get me wrong, the quality of the Acolyte's all right. There are some episodes that don't look great, some that look good. Um, But to me, I really think a good, probably, who knows, maybe 50 million of that show, like, they might have done a ton of reshoots they didn't make public. Like, that's the only thing I could think of, unless, like, people... And, like, the thing is, you don't have any super high-billed actors on the show yeah. like that are, like, you know, that are, like, Robert Downey Jr. level. Yeah, I mean, or, Robert like, Downey Anthony Hopkins or something like that. Yeah. There's nobody yeah. on there like that. Yeah, yeah, like, like, like if any, if you didn't see Robert Downey's making $100 million per Avengers movie, by the way. Um, but anyways, so, like, you don't have anybody like that that are 
cranking in, you know, fifty million dollars for a paycheck for a show. So it's like, I, I just think it has to be reshoots or something. Like that's my only explanation. Is I would guess it's reshoots because look at what happened with Indiana Jones. That was three hundred and fifty million under Disney, and like that movie bombed, and they had a lot, a lot of reshoots for that sh- that movie. And then hmm. even the Flash movie that came out for DC, the Flash was another mega flop and they had a lot of reshoots. So it just makes me wonder if like this show, because like the quality, you know, it's there in some parts and then it's not there in others in terms of just what you're seeing on screen. So it makes me think they probably had reshoots that they just didn't make public. If I had to, hmm. if I had to guess. Hmm. Yeah. And that's where the streaming bubble is, right? Like you were telling me, I think um, it's just like the Mm -hmm. window that they must hit is extraordinarily high to get a second season now. I feel like it's not just Disney. I feel like Netflix has that issue. There's a lot of different series. These 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 executives at first were like, oh, my gosh, we're going to we're going to get piles of money from these subscribers. But I don't know about you, but I don't think there's been much growth at all with any of this stuff if anything i think there's been a decline i know myself if i'm not watching a streaming service for any particular so i cancel it right away i'll resume it when there's a show i want to watch but i've gotten i I, i've tried to be mindful of like i'm not wasting you know 15 dollars a month if i'm not going to utilize even like things like game pass and stuff i've canceled until i'm ready for a new game to come out so i don't know if it's consumers just you know being more aware and be like okay i'm not paying for this there's not enough quality stuff for me to warrant paying for it for the whole year straight and now we're getting these influxes and now these there's there's not this cumulative uh stuff that's coming in constantly it's crazy yeah i'll tell you exactly what it is i just had this conversation over the weekend with our relatives from germany Mm. and you know and my other aunts and uncles we were talking about these streaming services and uh my one uncle was like, yeah, it's just complete BS that I have seven different streaming services and it's costing more than me just buying cable from like Dish Network or Spectrum or something. <laughs> like, because like, that's the problem. Like these streaming services, they're, they're moving up and up on price. I mean, look, Disney's going to increase its price, I believe at the end of this year. And they, um, you, you know they're cutting back on shows like like marvel's mm. down to one M- marvel's down to one who knows what star wars i mean if marvel's doing one year star wars might be doing one every other year <laughs> like who knows so it's like I, I just i don't know i think the quality is dropping because of that i mean i mean look for example i, I mean this was it could be different by now but back in like january february there was a report that came out i believe by forbes and like you know disney's like the lowest company that like the company that's losing the least every year is Warner Brothers on their streaming service and wow. they're losing like 20 billion a year. So like that oh. shows you, you know. Yeah, that shows you like how much streaming services it's just a suck of of money even for the companies. So it's like to me I don't know, I just feel like I I've been saying this to one my, my one friend for so long. And and I uh, I tweeted out a couple months back when I seen the Disney like price thing come out and I tweeted out the um, GIF of Thrawn saying "Long live the Empire" and I put hashtag "Long live cable TV" uh. because because I think what's happening is I think we're gonna circle all the way back around. I don't know how long it's gonna take. I think there's a thing because even HBO. I don't know if you saw this, Chris. It got reported they're mulling an idea of moving their show premieres back to HBO television and then next day put it on max they were considering so it's like i think we're slow slowly circling back around mm-hmm. to potentially getting to cable so yep. like who knows we might we might get to a point because remember they tested it already with andor and mando they showed them on abc networks for free and like they got solid viewership for being free television and the yeah. thing is that's where the money comes from are the commercial breaks yeah so so I think there's a chance. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it might be after Ahsoka. You, you know, I'm talking like this is like five years out. But I think there's a chance we might circle back around in the next few years to where maybe these Star Wars shows are premiering on like ABC or something. I, and then yeah. Disney, 
then the Disney is going to be used as a library. That's that is kind of along the lines I was thinking as well. I was I was mulling it around in my brain and going, what if the Acolyte was on cable? Like, would it have made multiple seasons if they just had commercial breaks? You know, in the case of the Acolyte, it could easily put it, be put on cable since most episodes are only 30 minutes. You have like 30 minutes yep. of advertisements. Give, just give it a whole hour. There you go. Yep. It makes all its money. There, there you go. Do that. Now, I mean, because the thing is with like the streaming was the idea of like, oh, they would probably have a bigger budget. They could do riskier, like more mature content because now it's on streaming. You don't have to worry about kids watching. You're picking what you want to watch. It's just not on there happening all the time. Stuff like like cool, like ideas. And we were all for it here and we're hitting that bubble. I've even been thinking about the idea um, that actually kind of maybe entangle with your idea okay so let's have these shows appear on cable but if you didn't have cable you could pay a la carte and buy the episode for like 3.99 or something or 2.99 or whatever if you wanted to watch it that night on streaming so that way you're paying directly for the content you want to watch it'll go to lucasfilm directly and disney for selecting that and then that that could make direct revenue based on that so they might have to do some kind of hybrid approach because at the end of the day like you said they're just losing money this is not working it's not working and for it to work like these things have to do extreme it's crazy it would it would solve it almost instantly if they had put it on cable almost instantly because advertising revenue is so high for 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 um, even 30 second commercials for big big TV spots, it's high. Much less, you know, if you're putting an advertisement on the premiere. For example, let's rewind all this. Like, obviously, Mando kicked off the Disney Plus era and pretty much was the foundation of Disney Plus. Mm-hmm. But, like, imagine how huge Mandalorian would have been if it would have kicked off publicly on ABC. Like, it would have blown up if they would have announced first Star Wars show, live action coming to public television or something or cable television whatever Mm. like i just think the opportunities are there there that's why like for example the nfl the nfl is like one of the biggest businesses in the world because of their advertising revenue you know everybody wants to advertise on nfl games they make billions and billions and billions per year on advertising revenue purely like um and, and it's just because of commercial breaks and like star wars could capitalize on that and then that's like even it goes back to even your whole um actor strike because you know they were trying to figure out all these like compensations for streaming mm. revenue and things. it'd be a lot easier it's a lot easier like the actors you know the ones where you had commercial breaks like those types of shows those actors like were getting co- compensated based on how long the show was on air etc all these things versus you know them making some weird calculations for streamers so it could benefit actors oh. it benefit a lot of people like i just i think that's where we're naturally headed though i think within the next few years it's gonna be i don't know i just my prediction within like this is a five-year prediction in the middle of august 2024 <laughs> so who knows but my prediction is with forget ahsoka but i think i think in our lifetime we're gonna see a star wars show premiere on on cable tv right. a live action show like yeah, I, I really re- i really truly believe it because it's too much money to pass up on and think a big factor is bob Iger started in abc he started in television so keep an eye on that all right I, if i were you i would tweet that out immediately after the show because yeah. <laughs> i feel like you could get a trending response on that because i've not yeah. heard anybody mention this I, that could be a brilliant move i mean that could really <laughs> What if, you know, what if? And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about our grievances, our my frustrations, and just, like, the idea. And, and lo- the long and short of it, to kind of wrap up this, is just, like, just like Xbox, <laughs> just like Xbox, it seems like every time that Star Wars is getting into a good spot, we just got this awesome skeleton crew trailer, Mando and Grogu from D23, Andor cool stuff happening, like a week and a half later or whatever it's like boom we get hit with the they they step on the rake it's like disney's just like walking boom it's just a good news happening they just they just take themselves out 
You know, uh, you know what I wish they would do? I wish they would just come out, give us a press conference and be like, all right, here's all the bad news coming out. Let's just rip the band-aid off and get it out of the way. Like mm-hmm. I, I just feel like that'd be so much better than like, you know, like you said, just dropping it. You know, hey, let's just slip the information to deadline really quick and let them let them take it. Yeah. Um I, I think that's a big thing. And then also I think the big thing too that really stems into all of this discussion tonight is the fact we haven't had star wars in theaters for by the time the next movie comes out seven years so it's like i think star wars is desperate to get back in theaters i really really do because you know we talked about it during mando season three we talked about it a bit even you know i know you liked andor but you know andor was kind of uh here and there but like even with that show it's like star wars needs needs to be back in theaters like i wholeheartedly believe i was telling my friend this just today actually i was talking to him on the phone if i had a button to press like don't get me wrong i love mando i love ahsoka all these things but if i had a button to press yep. and say i can eliminate all star wars live action television and just give me like three movies in the last six years that were good i would do that in a heartbeat because to mm. me star wars is a theater property like it's a theater experience like you know i we went and saw phantom menace back in may it was amazing. Yep. And like Star Wars, Star Wars is a theater experience. Like, and, and and the problem is, I feel like they're getting they got into a brand identity where they're like, hey, let's be a TV, a TV studio, you know, mm. and and that's kind of messed things up. And, and I really, really think Star Wars needs like they're desperate to get back in theaters. Like I, like we need that movie. Unfortunately, it's not until twenty twenty six, but we need, we need the movie to be a good movie and just like hit because star wars needs to get that theater presence back yeah oh and one last thing one last thing what do you think happens to the resolution of the acolyte i mean we left off on a huge cliffhanger plagueis was introduced you had official news come out that uh the stranger is actually the padawan or the apprentice of plagueis which means there's also uh, going to be Palpatine down the line. Like, what happens with this whole scenario here? You got these two Sith lords basically warring against each other. Uh, you got Yoda. You got the rest of the Jedi. Like that. That whole thing has been tied up. But you got Osha still. You got you got May still with her mind wiped and coming back slowly but surely. Like, there's a lot of resolution. I mean, the easiest thing here is just like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna finish it off in books. And yep. I really oh. hope they do at the very least. So, I mean, that, that that seems like the most likely thing, right? Yep. I literally, I just labbed this solution with my friend on the phone today. Me and him were talking about all this Acolyte news. And I said, hey, it's a good good preparation for this podcast tonight, actually. <laughs> um, I already came up with the idea for it that they could easily do. Obviously, like you said, it's probably going to book form. So, why not bring in, have James Lucino yep. come in. And have him be like, okay, we're going to work and like, we can go off the story thread of the witches talking about how the, how the twins were created, have Plagueis create the twins, you know, partner with the witches, do whatever Sith magic. Cause you know, he was into all that weird Sith science and mm-hmm. stuff. So have him be the creator of the twins and then have, have James Lucino rework like a new Plagueis novel. Don't yes. name it Plagueis because don't name it Plagueis because yeah. people will compare it. But do mm-hmm. something. Do a new novel with with Plagueis. Do it actually just like the Plagueis novel to begin with. The the first Plagueis novel, you know, it's broken up into all these parts of Plagueis' okay. life. So like, cause you know, it's broken up to when he's young, clear to when mm-hmm. he dies. So why not start out do this book? Have it be in the past where he creates the twins. You know, fast forward to where this is in the timeline of the Acolyte right now when they're older, deal with these events, and then move forward and just work into the Palpatine stuff and, you know, roll out the story that way. And, like, I, th- I think that's how you could do it. And the thing is, if you do it that way, like, if you have James Lucino on, on he, like, Star Wars fans would trust him to do that. Because, like, that was one of my big critiques at a, about a potential Acolyte season two. Like I didn't like a lot of the writing choices from Leslie Headland and crew. And that made me very nervous that it was like, man, are they going to come in and like, I don't know, have Darth Plagueis do some weird like power of two chant or something. So I'm just like, I don't need to see that. So it's like, but if I see James Lucino's writing the book, 
hey, I trust that guy because he handled Plagueis and Sidious' story perfectly before. So it's like, I think, in an ideal world, I think he comes in and writes the conclusion. You know, obviously, he'd have to, I'm sure, be partnered with Leslie to a degree because, you know, she created the show and whatever. But, like, have James Lucino come in and be the primary writer and just come in and just rework a Plagueis story that includes Palpatine, like, you know, like the old book. Yeah, yeah. And we were even talking on the tractor beam about how you could have maybe an extension of the higher public the higher public phase four or you could do something completely different like make a five make it more than one book make it like a five book series but just give it it's not the higher Republic, even though it's going to be set in a later later part like give it some cool dark side title this is a a five part series that will bridge the gap between the between the high republic phase three and the resolution the dark republic yeah, that's one way to do it. That's one way to do it. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it would um, be a good, yeah, yeah. interesting thing to do. I mean, like you said, though, I mean, that is the conversation everybody's talking about. Like you mentioned, you were talking about it on the Ion Cannon, and everybody's talking about it right now. Now, it's just... yeah. One thing that gets me nervous, and I don't know if you've seen this uh, around the internet, Apparently, if you go on to like the Disney website, you can't even like search for merchandise for the Acolyte anymore. And people are like, oh, no, please don't tell me the Acolyte is going the way of Willow, where they just straight up deleted off of Disney Plus for a tax write off or whatever the heck kind of corporate junk that was for an explanation. But yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've seen that. I, I saw that and my friend because my friend texted me and said, dude, did you see they, like, wiped it out of their website and stuff? And I was like, what? So it's just, like... I I don't know. It's just crazy. That would... Now, that would show... That would take some major... I'd have to give Lucasfilm some props for that, even though, like, obviously it would upset a lot of fans and stuff. But I'd have to, like, give Lucasfilm major props for actually, like, being aware and being like, hey, we have a plan. We're, like know resetting a lot of things but that would be crazy because like if they would do that i mean to me anyways that means you're wiping it out of canon like you know if, yeah. if, if they would go if they would go and delete it like if they go and delete it completely like that means you're wiping it out of canon completely basically mm -hmm. and it's just like that would i it's something to watch it's something to watch that's for sure because like it you know if they deleted all the merchandise what's next like you know, we don't want to, like, go into, like, panic mode or anything, obviously. But it's just, like, with the show being the way it was, you know, they, they've seen other things. I mean, look, it's not even like we've seen other studios. We saw the situation with Batgirl with Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. But look at but look at um, Willow. Willow got wiped out. The only way you can get a hold of that show is, like, through a pirated copy, basically. So it's just, like what's next for the acolyte like are we gonna wake up i don't know two months from now and it just be gone from existence like uh, i i don't know i don't know because guess what? i'm looking i'm doing more investigative work on the fly here if you go on starwars.com there's not there's not one mention of the acolyte on like the main page if you scroll all the way down like you're looking at your your banner and you're clicking through the slides there's not any acolyte on there you, you scroll down skeleton crew as it should be is like the first big banner then you go down below that as it should be is star wars outlaws and then beyond that there's just like a bunch of random articles but but you would have to literally click on certain segments to even get the word the acolyte to pop up like if you go under mm -hmm. if you hover over series you'll see it if you hover over news You'll see it, but it's almost like, oh my gosh, they, like, they don't even want people to go to StarWars.com and see anything about the Acolyte like on the front page, which is just like, what? It was only out a month yeah. ago. It's one thing if it was out like six months ago, but like you would think they would still have the articles, at least on the bottom of the, the, the page, like still viewable because they had mm -hmm. so much content when it comes out to, to the Acolyte. And uh, this is one thing I noticed when we were reviewing comics last night, me and Matthew... Um, if you look over on uh, the back of the cover of Star Wars, a great issue, by the way, Star Wars issue number 49. 
Oh yeah. The hit series on Disney Plus, The Acolyte. Uh, well, that might Boy, be an, that might be that a uh, salt like antique the or uh... <laughs> Well, that might be. Hey, hold on to that because if they if they wipe Acolyte off the planet, at least that'll be a that might be a vintage thing then. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! But like, for instance, like. All right, this is Star Wars Insider 227. Look who's on the cover, right? If you go to yeah. the next, the next, the preview of the next one, they got another Acolyte story. If you open up, the majority of this issue is Acolyte material. You know, yeah. it's just like, like all this, like page after page of behind the scenes Acolyte stuff this month and next month. Like Lucasfilm just put so that's why I'm also like surprised. Like it seems like Lucasfilm, they they flew out all these props and stuff to San Diego after the fact. Like all these these things, like like all this promotion that's still happening, and uh, they just cut the plug. I'm just like well, that's what shocked me. It's like okay, all these things still in the oven, and uh, yeah. they just pull the plug like that. Like damn. Well, like we said, I mean they're. To me, like, the more I think about it, too, even if, I mean, the likelihood, I don't want to say it's 0%, but the I think it's, like, a, probably, like, a 90% chance it's, it probably won't get deleted off Disney+, Plus. I would say. It's probably, like, a 90% chance, but the fact that they're, like, doing this already with the merchandise, moving the website around, all these things, that just shows right there, like we mentioned earlier in our discussion, they're definitely in a transition period for Star Wars. Like, there's no doubt about it. Like, I really think they're transitioning more and more to, like, the Dave Filoni-led Star Wars stuff. And, like, the thing is, too, you know, I've seen I've seen folks be like, oh, my gosh, well, we don't want only, like, Dave Filoni-like type Star Wars or whatever. <laughs> but, I mean, he's talked before how he, like, he's talked on record how he likes, like, Andor and stuff. So, like, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll get more things like that. But, um, it's just, I think we're in a transition period where it's going to be like projects that are greenlit by Dave and Carrie and bet or Carrie Beck. And I think that's where we're headed toward. Mm. Um, and like, you know, it's inevitable within the next, probably I guess five or six years, Kathleen Kennedy is going to retire at some point. So it's just like, I think we're in a full, transition period with star wars when it comes to this show because who knows maybe here's the thing think about this with kathy even you know she, i think i believe she turned 71 this year um like maybe part of this acolyte you know um part of this thing ending and getting canceled and like maybe this is just like an early step of her transitioning out of the company like mm. maybe you know maybe because like it's carryover like potentially like Think about it this way. If they go and greenlight the show, if Kathleen Kennedy, for example, is the one like saying, no, we got to do another season of it, or oh, no, we got to do it. If Dave Filoni and Carrie Beck aren't fans of it, like maybe they're like, no, 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 don't greenlight it because if you retire in a year, we don't want to look pretty much, you know, hey, we don't, <laughs> don't make us look like the bad guys if, if, if you're going to retire, yeah. you know, you're going to greenlight it and go. So I think, I think. It, this is the key transition period for Star Wars. I mean, look, we we flagged this at the D23 event when we talked about it mm -hmm. last time. Why was Kathleen Kennedy not talking there? And yeah. then the thing is, though, she was there later in the weekend. Mm -hmm. So that so that's the super odd thing. It's not like she wasn't there altogether. She was there later in the weekend. So why didn't she present the Star Wars movie? That's where you think she would be at because she's you know a producer and all this stuff. So like, mm -hmm. it just makes you wonder. Are we, obviously they wouldn't be public about it, but are we witnessing the transition period of Lucasfilm right now? I, I mean, all eyes are going to be on Japan in April. There's going to be a reckon. Oh, yeah. There's going to be an absolute reckoning with the Star Wars fan base. They're, they're going to want answers. <laughs> we, we go all the way out there to Japan, halfway across the world, I got to fly. They damn well should give us some clarity and some transparency because right now we are having more losses and wins and it's 
not going well for them to keep up this kind of persona, uh, this public facing, because the uh, yeah, people are not angry. Um, probably some people will start a chant at some point saying, renew the acolyte, renew the acolyte. I would be <laughs> very surprised if that didn't happen during like the presentation. Like, you know, th this is going to be very interesting in April. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I think I think part of it, too, that's going to be telling is. Like I said, keep an eye on the projects that are coming out, see who's involved and all these things, because and in the time periods where they're going to be coming, like, who knows? You had, um, like I mentioned, Sean Levy earlier. He's talking about coming up with ideas for his Star Wars project. And he, he did note, though, as well, that he wants a Star Wars project that can be a one-off project. Mm. So, so, you know, that is one thing he said in his Deadpool interview. So it's like, you have things like that, and it just makes you wonder... You know, if he's still potentially working on it, it's like, again, is this part of like a transition thing? Like, are we going to get an announcement? I don't know. Like, next year, boom, Sean Levy announcement. Like, hey, he's doing a, I don't know, something in the Mando timeline, uh, whatever, yada yada, Rebels crew movie, or I don't know, a Bill Burr led movie with, you know, that side of the galaxy or something. Like, I don't, I don't know, just something like that. Like, I think. I think there's a chance, like, depending on the time period of where these things are taking place, it's like, keep an eye on it. Because if it's taking place during, like, 6 and 7, like, you know we are 100% in the transition period for, like, pretty much Dave really shifting the ship. Oh, yeah. So, transitioning from this, I mentioned that, okay, you know, Lucasfilm, <laughs> they just got off of a really big win, and then we go downhill. But something that's looking very promising is Star Wars Outlaws, which for early access, people will go live. I think it's Monday at midnight, in, at least in East, on Eastern Seaboard here. They have a whole chart of when it's going live in your time zone. But for me, it's actually at midnight, not 3 a.m. So I fully expect to be sitting here on this computer ready to hit go as it hits 12 a.m. and I have to wait till 3 a.m. So I'm excited for that. But they did actually have a big presence at Gamescom. Um, and they also have a presence at Fan Expo Canada because Matthew sent me a, a message and I'm so jealous. He could win uh, an Outlaws t-shirt or a Nick's uh, stuffy animal uh, from a crane machine. I'm like, dang it, I want to get that. I said, please would be that. <laughs> but anyway, we shall see. And our friend Hannah had really good coverage this week. Go check her out, the race side, youtube.com slash the race side. She was able to, she's out there in Australia and Sydney. She was able to have a really cool experience. Two developers came down over there, down under, and they, uh, they, they were exposed, able to explain more of the art side of things and she got hands on with two hours and apparently she's getting to review the game early i uh, just yep. found that out so that's awesome for her it's great to see her like really explode with um the content creator uh stuff so she, she jumps in on a channel from time to time um and i for one and you know this as well that we're like the only Star Wars podcast somehow that she listens to. So she's probably listening to this like, hey, I don't know why you're listening to us, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, we got we got the uh, YouTube royalty listening to us. So yeah, go ahead. I'm looking forward to hearing her, her reactions after I play the game. Sorry, Hannah, but I'm going spoiler phobic on this one. I will be sure to consume that content when I beat the game myself. But um, I'm sure she's going to have nice things to say. It seemed like she had a good time playing playing it with her reactions of first playing the the demos but anyway we got the launch trailer as of today on thursday for the game gives us more details um apparently she's going to be doing a heist for 157 million credits at some safe some kind of vault and i know you're building up a team of these certain characters to be able to get to that point uh so that's really cool but uh we we've seen like an actual gameplay walkthrough as well of Akiva, and this is really neat. This is why I love Star Wars when you pull something from the books and and make it real life because that's what they did. They made this like tropical 
esque uh, rainforest type of planet with Akiva, which is actually where um, Tedman Snap Wexley was born. And Nora Wexley, her, his mother, that was from the Aftermath book. So really cool tie-in there. The Imperials have a presence there. Apparently the huts and the, and the pikes are duking it out in the streets. So it looks great. The environments look so nice. I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to just like spending so much time just walking around. Oh, what's that? Oh, that looks nice. And it's like a lot of emergent things happening as you get on your speeder bike which is actually designed like a motocross bike uh the director was saying where you can like do tricks and different things as you're like traversing to like another objective and as you're on your way you might see like an imperial shuttle land and you're like oh i wonder what what they're doing and you can just kind of get bypassed as any good open world game is you know you're going to do one thing you get sidetracked next thing you know you're doing two hours later of some other thing you didn't anticipate apparently sabak is is really cool in this game like you're going to be able to loot cards this reminds me of the witcher 3 wild hunt you're able to get cards by doing quests or something and you could use special cards in your sabak deck um when i played witcher 3 wild hunt for the first time i've spent uh, it seemed in my head maybe it was short it seemed like i spent the first 20 hours of that game just going around playing gwent which is like their version of sabak or just a card game and like you could go to like beat different people in, in 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 their bar in their taverns i guess or whatever you want to call them and then you would they would give you a certain card that you can actually put in your deck so this really reminds me of that and if that's the case then this game is going to have what it takes to really stand the test of time they have video game things you could play in like the cantinas you could bet on hor like fadia racing there's a lot to do in this game um and the launch trailer's out, and it looks fantastic. So, hey, we're ending on a good note, because I really have a good feeling about this. I feel like this is going to be at least to the level of Jedi Fallen Order, maybe even Jedi Survivor. We still don't really know much about the story. But from the gameplay, I'm so pumped, because it's a Star Wars stealth game. I think a lot of us were thinking it was going to be run and gun, but the more I've heard about people's impressions... Um, the more I see of it, there is a very big, heavy stealth aspect. And as somebody who loves playing Assassin's Creed, had just got done playing Assassin's Creed Mirage, which goes back to back to its roots with more stealth. I love a kind of mission where I can go in from the mountaintops overlooking an Imperial stronghold and marking my targets. Yes, it sounds like Far Cry. It's from Ubisoft. Relax, people. It's going to borrow some things, but it's going to be its own thing. And just go marking through targets and then crouching up, knocking out a scout trooper, and then just shooting like a stormtrooper in the back of the head immediately or something crazy like that. Like, this is going to be a nice change of pace jedi fallen order there's no stealth it's just action adventure jedi action squadrons space combat battlefront 2 just straight up soldiers versus soldiers every once in a while you play a hero this is that scoundrel fantasy that um i think we've deserved and um well on the, on the flip side of this episode the next time you guys will hear me talk i'll be giving my first impressions of the game so very much looking forward to that but i know you also watched uh, some of this as well so i don't know if you have anything to say about about the outlaw stuff i know we've seen a lot of it at oh, this yeah. point yeah i i mean i think i think that's a good way to like end off things tonight um on the podcast like i i think the trailer looks good i mentioned before in prior months like i'm not gonna play it right away when it comes out because i'm busy with like madden just coming out yep. 10 days ago and then the nfl season and like all this stuff but I'm probably going to play it more toward, like, probably the holiday-ish season, holiday, maybe in January. Like, it'll be it'll be a while before I play it. But I'm excited for, like, everyone that's getting to play it. And then, uh, yeah, excited that you're going to get to be playing it here soon. Um, so, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it looks like a really promising game. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. So, you can expect us to return not at our normal time. <laughs> Yes, uh, we are going live on Sunday, the, what is that, the, uh, the first? I guess it's September 1st. Wait, because we're not uh, doing, we're not doing a show this Sunday, which is the 25th. Yeah, the 1st of September, we'll be back at 6 p.m. Eastern. We're going hour, we're going live just an hour early. Um, to make sure all three of us can be here to talk about the latest in Star Wars. But yes, I will be giving my first impressions of the game. I will 
I can't imagine I'll be done the game by then. So yeah, let's just call it the first impressions of <laughs> Star Wars Outlaws. If I had time, I would take off a whole week, but I've never really done that for a video game. I'll find time when I can, and I'll and I'll work my way through it. How's that sound? So, yeah. But, oh, man, we had a lot to say on this episode, as I expected we would. I'm sure we're going to get Milton's uh, expressions and feelings when we are able to have all three of us sit down together on September 1st uh, to, to hash it out. Everything that has caught up, whatever drama uh, has come up before or, or before then. Right. So, yeah, but it was a pleasure uh, having a good civil discussion that I wish more people on the Internet would have been. So thanks for joining me tonight. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. I'm always here to have a good level-headed discussion. That's what we, you know, what we do here. Things are anywhere in between, really. So it's always a, it's always a good time. You can, for anybody who would be interested in hearing my opinion on Star Wars, fitness, um, the NFL, or Madden, or anything in between, really. You can find me on X and Instagram at Real Ben Maynard. And if you'd like to find Milton, he's on Twitter at Milton Weber Seven, and then. On his Instagram, he's a lot more active on there. He's always posting fitness stuff or recipes or workouts or things like that. And his account name is Milton7Weber. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So for Ben, for I, Chris, a.k.a. Star Raptor, for Milton, who couldn't join us this week, that's going to do it for Outer Rim Transmission, episode 165. And I promise you we're going to have a much more positive episode the next time for you guys it's gonna be the opposite i'm probably i'm hopefully gonna be all smiles and and laughs and and talking about this this crazy kooky little companion nixon and his compatriot there storming through the imperials and the scum and villainy of, of the star wars galaxy so until then we'll catch you later may the force be with you always and transmission